because what you don't know about energy can kill you. Here's Alex Epstein. Welcome to Power Hour. I'm Alex Epstein. Well, today I'm talking about a topic I've been passionate about for years and recently have been exploring in depth, which is the idea of decriminalizing nuclear energy. I believe that nuclear energy has some fundamental virtues that really no other form of energy can match, even fossil fuels in the long run. But I believe because of really bad government policies, it is held back to the point where in many places it's actually in decline around the world. So I've become very interested in how do we create a positive platform for reform of policies that nuclear can truly achieve its potential, which is something everyone should want, including the people who claim that CO2 is an existential threat. But nobody seems to be too interested in that. So I'm taking it upon myself to lead the creation of a nuclear decriminalization platform. And here to discuss that with me is, is a, a guy I've been studying for a little while, but I've recently learned a lot more about him. Really smart guy, uh, the, one of the co-founders of Thorcon, which is a thorium, which is a new form of nuclear uh, energy company, also teaches regularly at Dartmouth, and his name is Robert Hargrave. So Robert or Bob, welcome to Power Hour. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. All right. So just a little background on you. So how did you get interested in nuclear energy? And then how did all of that lead to Thorcon? Well, long ago, when I went to graduate school, I got my degree in higher energy nuclear physics. And I ended up doing my whole career, though, in information science, information technology. Uh, so when I finally retired back in 19, uh, about 2000, I got very interested in the energy crisis. And thought we were spending too much money defending Saudi Arabia and so on. So I was trying to get the U.S. to look harder at nuclear power as a source of energy. I got very interested in things like the high temperature graphite reactor, pebble red reactor, and so on. And eventually, I ran into people who were talking about molten salt reactors. And I really joined up with those people. And some of us put together a small team called Thorcon, which stands for Thorium Converter. It's a kind of a power plant that uses thorium and uranium both for energy. The idea of the Thorcon power plant was to make it inexpensive, to make it so cheap that it would persuade all the developing nations to use that kind of power instead of burning more and more coal. I think China just last year uh, built 30 gigawatts more coal powered, coal fired plants. And so why? And why in Indonesia? Why in Malaysia? And so on. All these countries where most of the people on earth live are in desperate need of more electricity just to make their lives closer to those that are enjoyed by people who live in Europe or in the United States. So our objective is really twofold. One is, is to help all those people get the energy they need. And two, do it in a way that doesn't exaggerate the problems we already have with too much CO2 in the atmosphere. So what, I guess, what, what, what is unique about thorium? that you think it's that that's a good route to pursue? Uh, thorium has a, a few advantages. Uh, one is it's a cheaper substitute for uranium. We still have plenty of uranium on Earth, but we can learn how to convert uranium, uh, thorium into uranium-233, which is a fissile, just the way that we convert uranium-238 to 235, which is a fissile material. So that helps. Uh, it, it also is a help for us in that it adds to the uh, difficulty in trying to proliferate weapons with the plutonium that's generated in a typical operating power plant. So we, we overcome one of those objectives as well. So what... Um... Uh, this is somewhat of a loaded question, given that it's coming from me. But what made you think that like solar and wind would not be adequate in terms of uh, empowering billions of people around the world? Uh, I'm thinking about the idea of think for yourself, people. When you look at the wind, you know it's not blowing all the time. When you look at the sun, you know it's not shining all the time. 
So how can you believe these elaborate papers and publications from people who say we can power the whole world or almost all of it on 100% renewable energy? It's just so obvious that you can't do it. Be if you do the back of the envelope calculations and how you would store that much energy, you find it's not possible. We read about people who want to put uh, tons of concrete on chairlifts and raise the concrete to the top of a mountain. But any uh, freshman in college who's taken a physics course can figure out that's just not feasible. I mean, we can't even store a fraction of our electric needs in by, by changing the Great Lakes into a a uh, energy storage, pump storage device. So we, we just have to get people to think for themselves and say, is this a, a reasonable thing? Do I really believe that we can do that? So that's yeah. my approach. Yeah, and I think the, the experience bears that out and the fact that it needs subsidies and mandates everywhere bears that out and that electricity prices go up whenever that right. Whenever they're imposed, that goes up. So what you know, the standard line these days on nuclear is, oh well, like nuclear is so expensive, da 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 da. da. So what made you think that well, nuclear could actually be so cost effective that it could outcompete coal eventually? We started out with a sketch of a design. One of the advantages of a foricon-like reactor is that the fuel, the uranium or thorium, is dissolved in a molten salt. In our case, of sodium fluoride and beryllium fluoride, so that the construction of the plant is a matter of piping. It's not a complex operation that moves all kinds of solid fuel around. So we have a cost estimate of every part that goes into the plant. And we say, look, we can do this for about $1 per watt of generation capacity. So let's do it. So we sketched that out. Uh, we went to the NRC, we went to the Department of Energy, and we proposed to them an idea that we could do a prototype plant in a, a place like Hanford, Washington, which is a sort of a contaminated area that the government owns where they built the plutonium plants for, for World War II, uh, still there. Uh, but the NRC has changed all its rules since the U.S. nuclear fleet was built and uh, they're not willing to allow us to use the same rules that were in place at the time the hundred or so nuclear power plants that have been built in the U.S. Uh, were constructed. So we finally said, well, we can't do it in the U.S. It's going to be too expensive. At that same time, the G GAO, the uh, Government Accountability Office, came out with a review and they said it would cost about a billion dollars in fees to the NRC, to designers, to consultants, to lawyers, and so on, to get the NRC's approval to just build the plant. So let alone the cost of building it. So we said, okay, that's not going to work in the U.S. So what was that? What was that number again? Just for that billion part? dollars over ten years is the estimated cost to just get the NRC approval for such a new plant. So th that of course means you can't raise any money to do that because that's a terrible investment. Uh, so we started looking elsewhere. And not only that, the US has enough electricity right now. Um, so we're willing actually to pay more for it. The price of electricity keeps going up and no one seems to be complaining too much. Uh, so, but the developing nations, particularly in Southeast Asia, need lots more electric power. And in order to get it, they're more open-minded. Uh, meanwhile, in the US, we're still building uh, light water plants, not a bad design, but expensively. The same plants that are being built in the US can, be, can and are built for a third of that price in South Korea, and so the South Koreans have taken that technology and done it and built plants in the United Arab Emirates. Again, at a third the price of the plants are now being built in Bogtol, Georgia. So uh, we said, okay, 
So we've, we have worked with the Indonesian government and have an office there, getting a lot of support for over three years. So what, yeah, what's the trajectory in Indonesia for what you're doing? The, tra- the trajectory right now is that starting next year, we'll build the, what we call the pre-fission prototype plant, the one where we can check out all the, 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 the pumps and valves and so on with a fluid that's not so highly radioactive as the operating nuclear power plant will be. And then in a couple of years after that, we will build that sh- uh, power plant on a ship's hull sp- specifically made for the plant in a South Korean shipyard. Uh, our founders were in the marine engineering business. Uh, they designed and built the world's largest super tankers. And they're more than familiar with the capabilities of the world's most competitive shipyards to fabricate steel into ships and machinery and so on. And we have dealt with those kinds of suppliers in Southeast Asia and and Asia and find that yes, they can provide competitive uh, construction of power plants. So that's that's part of the advantage of a Thorcom. One is the liquid fuel that brings the design cost of the plant down. And two is the use of shipyards and who have the skills to fabricate metals the way we want them to be completed. Gotcha. All right. So let's talk about the U.S. So you've indicated the U.S. is not a good place to try right now to try to build new nuclear. I would like it to be a good place. So let's talk about what are the, like, I want to just see an order. What are the big policy changes that you think would help that would be involved in what I call decriminalizing or, or at least having a more rational policy toward nuclear? And we'll just, you know, start with one and then we'll just keep going down the list. Okay. I, I think the biggest one is the efforts that EPA and NRC go through to try to placate people who say, oh my gosh, it's radioactive, it's dangerous, it'll cause, can- it'll cause cancer, and I'll die. So that's the biggest problem. Uh, the health effects of low levels of radiation are well understood, but they are exaggerated by nuclear power opponents, often funded by um, economic opponents, to say, oh, it might be dangerous. So the some there is a rule. For, well, as you might guess, in any situation where you're exposed to something foreign, there are typically limits in place. They say should be no more than, in our case, the, the public should not be exposed to more than one milligray or millisievert of rate absorbed radiation per year. Okay, that's all right. But now on top of that, people complain. They say, well, that might cause some damage. And the the government now has a project or policy called ALARA, as low as reasonably achievable. And the NRC uses that tool to say, well, whatever you do isn't good enough. So for example, although the the rule for the public in general at the power plant boundary is no more than one millisievert per year, the opponents got the EPA to agree that the limit at the Yucca Mountain boundary was going to be 0.15 millisieverts per year. These are numbers that are orders of magnitude below any observed harm that comes from radiation. Again, it wasn't deliberate. It was just a matter of, well, if you complain enough, we can satisfy you by lowering the number. And that's been the driving background that creates all these complicated uh, regulations. So yeah, how how is that? Uh, so how does it, how by having the incorrect, like the the arbitrarily low standard of millisieverts, how does that make it more expensive in practice? Well, let's take uh, well one example. Of course, would be this shielding that's required. Most of the cost of building a new 
power plant though, is all the engineering work that's going on constantly to build designs and get them reviewed and approved and so on that comply with all those rules. We're, the, uh, give me one example. The NRC says they wanna help and they wanna speed things up. And they're, they are trying and they've accepted the uh, applications from New Scale. They've accepted applications from Oaklo and so on but they still have to use their existing procedures. Now, one of the ideas that the new plants have proposed is, why do we have to have a, um, an evacuation planning zone that's so many miles broad when, when we do the simulations that might about radioactive materials that might be dispersed, it's, it seems to say that, you know, nothing beyond the plant boundary uh, could cause harm. Well, they're trying to do that, but now there's a new commissioner on the NRC and he says, well, I don't like that idea. So every time we try to get the regulations relaxed a little bit, there's some pushback to say, okay, we need to be sure we're safe as possible. And the other point of course is that other places don't do that. And China and Russia are exporting these kinds of power plants. And the, the countries that accept them don't have the same issues that the NRC seems to have. Uh, so we're in a situation where the US is losing a lot of market share for nuclear power plants and their components to in particular Russia. So how so you mentioned the shielding. So how does that work? Like how how much added expense approximately is there from like shielding that doesn't accomplish anything? Well, yeah, I can't easily answer that, but when you're talking about things, we're talking millions. But the point isn't that so much. If they said cut the cut it in half, we could do that. But if they say make it as low as reasonable, now you're stuck in a situation where where we don't know what they're going to say next week. In fact, all, one of the problems is the so-called LNT theory, linear no threshold theory of cancer hazard from radiation exposure. And that theory was proposed more than a half century ago. It's been disproven. But the idea is that if you say have a 1% risk of getting cancer from a hundred millisievert exposure, then you're gonna get a half percent risk from getting a 50 millisievert exposure. Right. That is linearly, uh, but- Right, like if I get way. sunburned by being outside all day, then if I'm, I'm gonna get right. partially sunburned by being outside a minute. And so I should never right. go out in the sun. Right, so that, that's a bit of a, a problem. And even though that biological responses typically are so-called sigmoidal, or that is they exhibit thresholds, uh, the NRC and the EPA do not do that. They say it's perfectly linear. There's no way to avoid some potential harm all the way down to zero. So that needs. So that just strikes me as LNT needs to be abolished from yes. government okay. and for science example, and laws. I'm a member of a group called Scientists for Accurate Radiation Information. Mm -hmm. And we and some of the members have independently petitioned the NRC uh, with evidence to uh, eliminate that rule. And now it's been six years that the NRC has not acted on our petition uh, to do that. So we, we try hard. There are thousands of papers that are published that prove beyond a doubt that LNT is wrong. And the response of the regulatory agencies is not to respond. They ignore all these petitions and papers as if they never existed. So that's the situation we're in. Okay, so we gotta get rid of LNT, get rid of Alara. In terms of what, what is the actual, like what's an actual science-based threshold? Cause I don't think it's one, it's it's like a lot higher than one, right? In terms sure, so of- the, the, uh, Within the last year, the Institute, in cooperation with some others, came together with a, a, a statement. And the statement was that a single exposure in a short period of time of 100 millisieverts, uh, which is 
so, you know, not a lot, but cannot cause harm. Now you can see temporarily, you can see temporary changes in the cells of the body, but nothing permanent is ever damaged with a single exposure of 100 millisieverts. No problem. So, okay, so if 100 was the standard and there's no Alara, there's just 100, there's no LNT, it's actually based on science, how would that help the situation in terms of cost? It would help in the sense that uh, when we tell the public that the power plant's not going to irradiate more than one millisievert anywhere under any circumstance, they'd be happy with a factor of 100 safety between what we're claiming to uh, uh, release as opposed to what's damaging. So there'll be a lot less uh, complaints that force the regulators to try to pacify the public. So that's, that's the way that would have to work. I mean, here's another way I wanna get at this issue. What are your, What in your view are the largest unnecessary costs imposed on nuclear by bad policy? <sighs> largest unnecessary costs. Um, it's hard to capsulize it in, you know, there's not no one or two things that do that. Um, I mean, you can give me a range. I just want to give people a sense of, because we're saying, you know, in South Korea, it's a third the price. Like, right. that's a lot. What's that two thirds of fat? Like, well, what is other, that? For example, um, requirements for qualified suppliers. Uh, the so-called end stamp idea that only these people who have these procedures in place that are approved by the particular organization can provide materials to the power plant. Uh, that's one. Our idea in our company is to say, look, we want competition. We want to throw open the competition to lots of suppliers to get the cost down. Uh, but uh, in the case of U.S., we need specialized suppliers. Interesting. All right. So what? Are, okay. So we've got gotten rid of LNT, gotten rid of Alara. What else should policy do to change? What else? Hmm. How? What else should policy? To, to change. Well, one is to sort of educate the public on what the real damage is. I mean, it isn't just setting the regulation, it's telling the public and proving to the public that it's not dangerous. Well, let's take one example, Fukushima. Uh, people are frightened about that because they think it hurts people. But even if you apply the LNT rule and say, here's the damage to the population caused by Fukushima, the answer is nobody was harmed, nobody. The UN came and they looked at the damage, they looked at the radiation and they said, well, we, no one has been harmed, but we're not telling people that hey, had, at these levels, it's perfectly safe. What we're saying is, oh, we'll tighten the regulations to make sure it's safe. So our whole attitude of sort of placating people by saying, oh, we'll make sure it's less next time is not right. What we need to do is to be realistic with people, assume they can understand that the, the health effects and understand where it really matters. And where it matters is if you're up at 2000 or 3000 millisieverts at once, as were the people who were cleaning up the mess at Chernobyl. Those uh, firemen and emergency workers were exposed to much higher levels of radiation, thousands of millisieverts. And uh, what, 28 of them died eventually. Uh, but at Fukushima, nobody died from radiation exposure. At Three Mile Island, nobody died. And so people are unreasonably frightened and that's the driving force that makes the regulations so confusing. What do you mean so confusing? Well, uh, I was just today looking to myself, trying to 
explore the NRC website to try to find something out. And it's all a matter of this document supersedes that document. Uh, it is very, very hard to, to actually find things out as in a sort of an engineering sense as to what it would be. It, it, I, I, it's hard to explain for me. So yeah, it's, well, let's go back to what, when was the NRC established and what did we do before the NRC? Well, before the NRC, long ago, we had the AEC, the Atomic Energy Commission. It was set up really at the impetus of uh, Eisenhower, who wanted to blunt the, the sort of memory of destruction of the weapons over Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And so his idea was, well, we ought to be able to harness nuclear power. And the Atomic Energy Commission was charged with uh, basically harnessing nuclear power safely. The NRC was established about 1975 because people said, well, you know, the regulator has a different role than the promoter. So the NRC was established to protect the public and the function of promoting nuclear power was given to the, what turns out now to be the Department of Energy. And um, the NRC regulates the plants that are proposed and regulates their operation today, regulates the operation of all plants. But it's a fact that all of the plants that exist in the United States today were designed and started their construction before the NRC was founded. That is, not a single plant has been designed and built in the whole tenure of the NRC since 1975 or so. So why don't we abolish it? Well, you need to have some, you need to have a safety function for sure. Uh, but we need to have one that's realistic and deals with the true possible harms. Well, what if what if it's just like in other things where if you know if you know there's a certain threshold of threat, let's just say it's 100 millisieverts, can it just be that that's the law that you can't do that? And then you can if somebody is in your area and you have evidence that they're violating it, then you could sue them or you can bring some sort of tort. I don't see why you that, need a whole NRC for that. You can just get rid of them. Correct. That's the kind of rational behavior we'd like to see. Uh, but that's not what is happening. Um, both the EPA and the NRC uh, use this linear threshold, linear no threshold idea. Um, but isn't the whole idea of the NRC that you're like guilty until proven innocent? So you need to you need to prove to their satisfaction that you're not going to kill uh, well, sure. everybody. Well, that's reasonable, of course. I mean, they, they want to review the plans that you propose in detail uh, long before you fire up the machine because, Why? <laughs> because they want to protect the public from uh, people who might not engineer a safe power plant. So you need to have some kind of reviews, uh, just like we have in the auto industry or and so on. So it's reasonable to have safety reviews. Yeah, but like if I build a house, I mean, I guess they, there's a little bit of sure. review, but there's not that much. You know, the house can explode, you know, it can hurt my neighbors, but that usually they have to have evidence that sure. there's, I just, it just seems like why is everyone treating, particularly if you're using like uh, standard technology, they're treating nuclear as this unique menace, which I don't think it is in terms they, of they the are, safety. They are, that's correct. No other power source has a special Department of Energy devoted to it. There is no uh, natural gas regulatory agency. There is no hydropower dam. Right, and those are much more dangerous. Right, exactly. So why don't we just, you should just get rid of it. We should have the same, well, I don't know why we need a new, but look, you just think of a gas, and I'm a big fan of gas, but you just think of like a gas line exploding. That's a hell of sure. a lot more dangerous to me than San Onofre power plant could ever be. I mean, if something goes wrong there, you know, you have time to evacuate, it doesn't explode. So why is nuclear getting its own unique thing? Because the public has been persuaded that it's especially dangerous. 
uh, somehow. And so, the, yes, the NRC and the EPA should be truthful. They should lead the public. They shouldn't follow the fears that have been instilled in the public uh, for years. Yeah, so I think there's there's a question of should this, I just want to, I'm just raising it. I think we should really question, does this thing even, should it even exist? And then if it does exist, it definitely needs to have scientific uh, uh, standards. Doesn't it also just charge companies a fortune for its review process? Well, that is true as well. And that's a little bit of a problem in the sense that the Congress says to the NRC, here is a small amount of money. I've forgotten the number, 100 million a year. And your budget is, I've forgotten the exact number, but much more than that. So the NRC is sort of self-supporting in a lot of ways because it charges every power plant a million or two dollars a year in order to support the NRC. When it comes time to licensing a new power plant, every interaction, every hour that any NRC person spends in reviewing your application is charged to an account that you have to pay for it. So they're paid a, I forgot the number exactly, somewhere around $300 an hour for everyone who works on it. So there is an incentive within the NRC to keep the money coming in. That is, once they say yes, the gravy train is over. Okay. Yeah, I mean that is that is a crazy incentive. So how does that compare to other industries? I don't know how how are do other industries all pay for all their own you know, regulators? I don't, know the, I don't know the answer to that. Okay, like I'm gonna and so I'm on. gonna yeah I'm gonna research that. Okay, so if you take your own example, so you were told that for Thorcon it would take a billion, you know, billion dollars, which is a lot of money. Uh, how like what should it actually cost in your view for a rational review process? Well, you would think it would cost less. <laughs> what would it cost for a rat? To actually movie? ensure that you're not posing some unusual threat to your neighbors that's going to kill a whole bunch of people. You would think that a, 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 a dozen engineers at a couple hundred thousand dollars a year each working for a year on the design would be more than enough. So what's, what is that? So a couple dozen at a hundred. So we've got a couple of dozen highly skilled. Okay, we've got, so we've got 25 people and let's yeah. say they're making $200,000 a year. year. Yeah. Okay. So what's that? $20 million. Uh, do the math. Uh, 25. So that's uh, $10 million. Right. It's either five or 50. My, my mental, I've noticed my mental math skills have, <laughs> gone down as I've aged. But so uh, something like that. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So it's uh what is it? You so say you said 200,000, yeah, 200,000 a year times 25 people. So that yeah. would be yeah, like 50 million dollars, I think. Yeah. Okay. Something like that. Okay. Would that would you be able to do it? I mean, how would that affect your economics? That'd be fine. I mean, it costs a billion dollars to build a plant, right? Order magazine. And this is just to, and this is for the first one, right? This is for a Correct. new design. Correct. Not if it's a proven right, right. design. Right. Now, every power plant from then on is the same, except for some siting issues, like where's the cooling water coming from and that sort of thing. So there'll be just the normal standard uh, environmental review you have for anything. If you're going to build a textile factory, or if you're going to build a, a gasoline refinery, you're going to have some sort of environmental review. And that, that makes sense for nuclear power plants as well. Yeah, it's just it's so unbelievable to me that it is a billion dollar thing for this. Again, it's this, I just want to stress, this is like, there's, there's nothing that can, like a dam breaking, you know, that in the wrong place could kill 10,000 people. And did. No yeah. problem. Yeah, there's nothing like, like that can't, there's nothing like that that has ever happened with any nuclear reactor, even Chernobyl. And no, but you have to understand that at, after Chernobyl, there was a great hue and cry about the clouds and spread and so on. And the Ananics were documenting and claiming that almost a million people have died because of Chernobyl. Now, that isn't true, but it was published in New York City and on and on. And a lot of people believe it. So in the back of their mind, they have the idea that, oh, my gosh, 
you know, that radioactive cloud's going to come and kill me. Uh, that's, and it's not true, but people believe it. And so politicians say, we're going to make sure that we're protecting you. Take, take uh, Vermont. Uh, governor Shumlin, in running to become governor, uh, wanted to shut down Vermont Yankee. And so he promised the people that he wouldn't let them harm that he would avoid the harm. And sure enough, uh, eventually Vermont Yankee shut down. It was a way to blame something to make the politician be the hero and save the people and get the votes. That'll happen time and time again. Yeah, it's, I mean, I just saw this year, you know, EIA announced that they're having a record shutdown of nuclear plants this year. And yes. all these people claim to care about CO2. And right. they're shutting down these plants that, you know, are very cheap to run. Right, right. In a, in a way, the industry hasn't done a good marketing job. I was just reading the other day that in France, which is 70% nuclear power, of the young people who say 20s to 30s, 86% of them think nuclear power plants contribute to global warming. And the, even though they don't emit CO2, they're nukes. That's why the Europeans want to get rid of all the fossil fuel and nuclear fuel I would fuel love plants. to see that statistic. That's If you could send that to me, that would be great. That is perfectly revealing of the whole yeah. education system. What? See, oh, go ahead. There's just no marketing of the, uh, of the, of the real story. So what, what's gone wrong? So the, I know there have been these plants in Georgia that have seemingly had a lot of cost overruns. What's been going on with those? Well, two, two things. One, one is, of course, the industry is always there, and that creates hurdles. But two is, we haven't built nuclear plants in the U.S. in a long, long time. And we don't have a supply chain in place. And all that was being conceived of and built, that, that is all the suppliers, at the at a time when no one in the last half century had done such a thing in the US. And the people who were in charge of the project weren't particularly skilled or experienced, right? They were uh, utility companies that hadn't built power plants in a long time. And they made deals with other um, engineering, EPCs, engineering procurement construction contractors that weren't that skilled at it anymore. And it was an enormous project. We're talking about many thousands of people on the work site at a time. Um, so with the inexperience, um, it just was so over the top that one of the projects, the one in the Carolinas, uh, was abandoned halfway through at a cost of, I don't know, four or five billion dollars. What, what? Yeah. So, did is one of them have, have has any have any of them been completed? Because you mentioned that nothing has been completed, or since the NRC, or nothing has been completed based on new plans since the NRC Correct. was well, created. We have a plan that might get completed. Yes, the one in Georgia. Uh, there is actually a pair of them. Uh, there are the Westinghouse AP one thousand designs, and I think those projects are coming along well. If they had a big problem at the very beginning. So within a year, I think one of those plants will be running and the other one just behind it. So I, I think they're over the, the biggest hurdles. Yeah, the NRC needs to be renamed. It should be something like the NCC, like the Nuclear Criminalization Commission, or the <laughs> Nuclear Stopping Commission. Because it seems, I mean, that's really remarkable right. that no, and this is, this is, 75. This is 40. This is 45 years, 46 yeah. years. But let me let me talk about tritium, for example. Um, tritium is hydrogen with two extra neutrons on it. Mm -hmm. And you probably have read it that they have also these water tanks around Fukushima that have a little bit of tritium in the water. And the people are afraid of it, even though the decay from tritium is so weak, you can't measure it with a Geiger counter, okay? Mm -hmm. It's really weak. No one's ever been harmed by tritium at any level of concentration. And so, but people are afraid they're gonna put it in the ocean. 
not just people in Japan, people in other parts of the, of the, on the Pacific Rim are afraid of it, even though it's a trivial amount of radium. So I look up on the NRC website about tritium and they have a headline that says, is it safe? And yeah, read everything on the NRC site about tritium and they never say it's safe. They refuse to say something is safe. Uh, they just say, here are what people think. And of course, there are some people who think, well, there could be a problem, but they never come to a conclusion. So they never take an active role in trying to reassure people that nuclear power is safe. They How long? What do you think is a reasonable amount of time for an NRC approval of a new design? Like how long? I think they should have a cap on the approval time. Well, that would be nice. But if you put a cap on it, they're going to say, oh, cap's coming. I haven't got time. No. <laughs> so the cap's not going to work. But you, you could encourage them to get it done in a year. Yes. Yes. Well, why can't, yeah, maybe it's, I mean, in a better world, it would be, you have to, you have to actually prove something in a year. Otherwise it goes ahead. Yeah. You have a, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> I agree. But of course, once you put that hurdle in place, someone will be frightened and raise your hand and say, this bolt is the wrong size, you know? So any other, any other thoughts on reforms that would be helpful to make you know, you can think of it from your own perspective, like what, what reforms would help that would make it possible to build Thorcon plants in the U.S.? Well, um, well, as I said, allowing uh, more vendors to compete in providing the parts they have to go into the plants. Uh, again, LNT and ALRA are just, just wrong. And if you were to eliminate every regulation in the NRC that is, in de that is dependent on that point, uh, the numbers of rules would go down by an order of magnitude. Has um, anyone done any work on showing that, like how, how many of the rules and costs are related to LNT and uh, AL ARA? I don't think so. Oh, that'd be a good, that'd be a good project for somebody. Uh, just because I, yeah, I think it's very powerful that this, that these fundamental, these fundamentally bad metrics are just leading to this proliferation of, it's like nuclear criminalization proliferation. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, the, the, and of course, if we, if, if we really push hard on the NRC about ALA and, and uh, LNT, they're going to say, Oh, well, that's the EPA rule. And okay, so then we have to go after EPA. And they also will say, and EPA will say, well, we want to be uh, compatible with the international uh, organizations like the International Radi ICRP, International Commission for Radiation Protection. And all these outfits that are sort of uh, advisory organizations have long-term members who have sort of grown up in an era where you simply say, this is the policy. And these are, policies are in place. And I claim once you have a policy in place, the science doesn't matter. It's a really big problem to get people to um, review the policies. We tried to do that. Uh, some of our members of SARI, SARI, the Scientists for Accurate Radiation Information, have been writing papers constantly. One of them was put on the advisory commission, the Radiation Advisory Council for the EPA uh, during uh, the Trump administration. Uh, Trump had tried to, and the EPA had tried to begin assessing the validity of the LNT. Uh, and there was a lot of pushback on that. Uh, I mean, for example, LNT is also the vehicle by which we, um, I think, um, uh, we, we uh, assessed another kind of damage. I'm trying to think what it was. 
for a minute. Well, it's, it's used in all chemical uh, things too. Oh, um, I've forgotten. But anyway, we tried to push back on those rules, but couldn't. But basically, even Trump couldn't get, get those rules pushed pushed back. And now all that effort, of course, will be reversed because we have a change of an administration. And that's another problem is how can we have rules that change every four years? Uh, if we had rules that were more or less science-based, uh, they wouldn't be so subject to fluctuation with changes in, admin in administration. So yeah, final question I would ask is, yeah, what is what do you see this administration portending in terms of these different nuclear criminalization policies? Are they going to get worse? Are they going to get better? Are they going to stay the same? I, I don't know. I There's a new bill that's out that has everything you'd ever want on it if you were a 100% renewable advocate. But it also uh, is supportive of nuclear power in a sort of a broad way, not down to the specifics about what happens at the NRC. And that, that's another situation we have too, is that we have, on the one hand, politicians and organizations that say, we like nuclear power, let's put some money into it, let's add another billion dollars to the new scale project, let's do some R&D and use our national labs to help Thorcon or Terra Power or someone like that. And that's all good and it's happening, but there's nothing happening on the other side of the table, on the NRC and EPA side that's there to block any progress. Yeah, so that's, this is, uh, I think we're on the same page. I think this is a, a huge strategic mistake of the pro-nuclear movement is just basically asking for these handouts, but not not advocating for a, competi a truly competitive situation. Because if you're right. if you could be criminalized, they can stop anything, even if you come up with a good innovation. And the way innovation happens is lots of, you know, millions of smart people figuring things out and competing. You don't, you're not going to scale a solution based on government handouts in, in right. a criminalized uh, environment. So it's just, I, I think nothing is going to happen substantial until this, until decriminalization happens, at least in the US. I think it'll yeah. happen other places that don't have that degree of criminalization. Yeah. Our long-term strategy is simply to get the developing nations cheaper power to make their economies prosper, and then they'll become economically competitive with the U.S., and the U.S. will notice. And the reason will be that there's lower energy cost embedded in the products that are coming from these newly developed countries. So as our own economy competes against them, they're going to, they're going to say, well, why are costs so high here in the U S so that might be a. a yeah. A that's a little long problem. for me to wait. Uh, yeah. And you know, they, yeah. So great. So we're going to buy our solar panels and wind turbines from Thorcon produced plants instead of Chinese coal plants. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. So I, I, I would like to expedite this. Yeah. So thanks. Thanks for coming on to talk about this. I really, um, interested in I'm you know, talking to as many nuclear people as I can, because I do think it's important to have as much like as concrete proposals as possible and to really be able to document here's all the bad things. So I'm going to, I appreciate your helping with this and I'm going to keep asking other people. I know you have a, what's your colleague's name who wrote that Gordian Knot book? Oh, Jack Devaney. Uh, yeah. You can go look at GordianKnotBook.com, his website. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can download that book or you can go to Amazon and try and buy it there too, but it's free if you download it. Yeah, that looks that looks really good. And then uh, tell us about your books that you have out. Okay, I've got a couple. Uh, one is uh, Electrifying the... Uh, here, I'll show you a picture. There we go. Electrifying Our World. And that is a results from a course I taught at Dartmouth. And what it really is, though, is... So all the slides for the course, hundreds of pages of them, and text to go with them. But you can get it either online or from Amazon. It's pretty good. Uh, another, another book I wrote uh, early on was called Thorium Energy Cheaper Than Coal, because I've been on this theme all along. If we can get another source of energy that doesn't emit CO2, that's the way to go. Not only do we solve the CO2 problem, we help economies by giving them cheap energy. So that's that's what I've been up to. 
All right. And then where can anywhere else they can follow you? Like I know you're on Twitter, I assume. Where else should people look um, for you? You know, I'm not a Twitter expert. I okay, well, where where any anywhere else people should go, or should they just buy your books and that's how about how about on Facebook? Thorium energy cheaper than coal is a one of the destinations on Facebook. And I All post right. there two or three times a week. Oh, okay. Terrific. Good to know. All right, Bob, thanks so much for coming on the show and for helping us understand how to pursue nuclear rationally. Okay, great. Take Thank care. you. Best of luck to you. All right. Thanks again to Bob Hargraves for coming on. So I got a lot of useful information there. I think one thing though that this, this shows, which I'm I've known for a while, but this reinforces is just we need more thinking about this issue. We need more specific policies that are bad and why and explaining that. And then we need to identify what policies are good. So I'm going to continue to interview people, to talk to people, scan my network. But if you know anyone or you yourself have ideas on like what are good policies, what are the right policies, and then also what are the wrong policies and what are the demonstrable negative effects of those policies, that would be great. I, I, one thing I'm very emphatic about with my own work, but also when I talk to elected officials is we always need a positive policy. We need a positive vision and a positive policy. And if we don't have a clear policy of our own and we just complain vaguely about what's going wrong, then nothing is going to change. But if we can have like a clear path forward that we keep promoting and keep promoting and keep promoting, then there's a real opportunity for change. So very interested in more information on nuclear decriminalization. As always, if you have any questions, comments, love mail or hate mail, you can email me at alex at alexepstein.com. Uh, for energy talking points, you can follow me on Twitter, twitter.com slash alexepstein. And of course, energytalkingpoints.com. To support our work at the Center for Industrial Progress, specifically our research and development and promotional efforts, you can become an accelerator, industrialprogress.com slash accelerator, and make sure to get on my mailing list, which you can sign up for at alexepsteinlist.com. Also, I haven't mentioned it in a while, but since things are starting to open up, you may want me as an in-person speaker in addition to a virtual speaker. So you can go to, uh, I think, industrialprogress.com slash speaking and learn more about that. Or you can just email me directly if you have a specific engagement in mind. All right, that is it for this week. I'll be back next week with another great guest. Until then, I'm Alex Epstein. This has been Power Hour. Power Hour. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of energy. Power Hour. The antidote to shallow thinking about energy issues.